Hi, this is Paul. It's been kind of an emotional day for me. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about it. I had to put a friend in jail today. Um, I've got a long history with this friend. Um, I knew the coming of the rains was going to provoke a confrontation. This individual moved into the neighborhood probably about 10 years ago. He, um, I don't know all the details, but his life fell apart. He moved into a room and board, and in my neighborhood, um, this is kind of in a place in town that was developed in the late 50s, early 60s. The lots are a little bit bigger. The houses are a little bit bigger. And in the 80s, 90s, when this became a less desirable neighborhood, um, board and cares, room and boards, group homes, uh, tended to pick up houses here. And so this individual moved into a, a room and board. It was there for a while. Um, found out a couple of weeks ago that actually the, uh, the owner of the room and board um, is the brother of this individual's drug dealer. It's amazing how these relationships go. And he, um, this individual was living on disability and in order to supplement, he was probably at the room and board at that point, having to pay six hundred some a month, maybe getting eight, nine hundred a month in disability at that point. And so a lot of it was taken up just with his rent. And so he'd go picking garbage in the neighborhood, and when we would find something that he could strip some metal out of for recycling, he would strip the metal out. But it might be a plastic fan or something, and so he'd he'd smash it to bits to get the metal out and then leave a huge mess. And you ask me how I know this, I'll get to that in a few minutes. Well, the landlord of the room and board had had it, probably not just with the garbage picking and the metal stripping, probably with uh, this individual because he's bipolar and um, he tried to manage his bipolar with drugs and alcohol and street drugs and so kicked him out. And when he kicked him out, which... This individual didn't start in this neighborhood. He had been married. He and his wife and his four kids lived on the other end of town. Um, this is where you can get a room and board, as I mentioned before. Got kicked out, became homeless, and the designers at the church building where I work couldn't have designed a building better for sheltering homeless in the Sacramento winter. And there's a little area just outside my door that one person once dubbed the foundation of the Lord. So this individual left that room and board and was quite happy to not have the um, overhead of paying a monthly rent. And so he could devote all of his money to drugs and alcohol and drumsticks and a variety of other things that he really liked. And he slept right outside my door. As I mentioned before, literally against my door, and in one moment of honesty, he told me, you know, I slept against your door, so you would have to talk to me. And so over the last um, six years before something else happened, which I'll get to, you know, we became friends. And yeah, royal nuisance. I would get to work, and I would take out my phone, and I would take a picture of the garbage like this. And what, what I have on the picture here is mild compared to what it was most days. For a while, there was a toilet that he pulled out of the garbage that was sitting there. And, um, you know, people would look at me and say, how can you tolerate this? And um, uh, it's not so easy to deal with something like this because... This is a royal nuisance for the police, and they have a hierarchy where they prioritize personal danger and a nuisance crime like this. Um, yeah, anyway. So for about six years, he lived against my door, and um, he was bipolar, and I watched all of his swings. There are times when he would clean up the whole place and plant new trees and brag about he was an asset, not a liability, and uh, this individual grew up Mormon. I've uh, learned a lot about um, the LDS church from him, the good family. Um, and yeah, other nights at that point for a while, I was, uh, my wife and I homeschooled. And so she would go to work during the day as a teacher in a public school. And I would homeschool kids. And then I would come to church about three o'clock and I would work from three to 10. And so I'd be in my office at night 
after the sun would go down and he would be leaning against my door and he would just curse his existence and just curse, 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 curse. I don't want to live. I don't want to live. I don't want to live. And a lot of times he'd come into the office and we'd just talk and he'd just talk. You know, any, any kind of admonition, don't try to fix me. Okay, I won't. Well, this went on year after year, and of course the congregation didn't care for it much. Um, as long as I was around, I could sort of manage him. There'd be times when he would threaten my life and go off, but um, he's a little older than I am, a little smaller than I am, and what I've seen from a lot of street people that are actually surviving on the street, if they're too violent, they wind up in jail. If they're too stupid, they wind up hurt or dead. And if they're right in the middle, smart enough to only pick fights they know they can win, well, then they, they sort of last and they sort of survive. And so, yeah, he'd threaten my life sometimes, and then he'd come in and be all, um, you know, if, if, if you'd ever been married to an alcoholic or, or someone with mental illness, you know the routine. And, and so in many ways, he and I have been sort of married for all of these years, except I get to go home at night, and this place was his home. Well, I went away on vacation, and that's always when the real trouble happened. And uh, someone, a member of the church, threw away a bunch of his stuff because his stuff was all over the place. And this was a older man, quite a bit older. And there was an altercation. He attacked him. And that's when the law got involved. And, uh, yeah, um, arrested him. Went to jail. From jail to a mental health facility. And um, then when left there, it was a restraining order. Not supposed to get within 150 feet of here. Supposed to stay away from this individual that he attacked. I knew that wasn't going to work because he told me all the time, I feel safe here. Gangs would pick on him. They'd try to get inside. There'd try to be programs that, that would help him. And, um, yeah... So I've been sort of trying to keep him away, you know, work on encouraging him. He'd get ideas, say, I'm going to, he's got a storage unit you're nearby. I'm going to, you're not going to even know I was here. Well, you shouldn't be here at all. But you're not even going to know I was here. You won't see my card. I'm going to give up the shopping cart. Couldn't do that. Not even going to know I was here. So yesterday, his shopping cart was outside my door. He wasn't here. All right, watching that. I left about 6 p.m. at night after making a video, and uh, he was bedding down. And I thought, okay. But I knew if I called the cops then, you know, it's nothing would happen because it's you have to, It's a little tricky to get the police involved. He's got to stay. They've, he's got to be here. They've got to be here. So it's always difficult. I get here this morning, and he's still here. And he's got to usually sort of medicates himself with beer. Now he's got a bottle of harder stuff. And I know that when he drinks the harder stuff, I always, I always, I always kind of gauge him on a clock. Twelve, he's manic. Six, twelve, he's at the peak of his mania. Six, he's at the peak of his depression. And um, after, if I see him every day for a while, he can kind of gauge his cycle. And I knew, you know, if he's at the peak of depression, was not not a lot happens. He just lays there and curses his existence. Um, if he's at the peak of mania, he's a, he's a really fun guy. And I knew that he probably was at least five or seven, probably seven. And so he was depressed enough to be angry, to be taking harder stuff than just pot or beer, but uh, not manic enough to be energetic and very much in control of himself. And so, yeah. And so I came in. Said a couple things to him, put my stuff in the office. Thought, what am I going to do? It's rainy season. This is the only place he has to stay out of the rain. Um, what am I going to do? Can't let him stay here. I can't get back into the cycle. So I thought before I take steps with the law, I'll at least see if I can make progress with him by talking to him. So. I have all these pastoral tricks that I use to talk to people. I just someone on Twitter just just lent out a tweet. Don't listen to Paul Vanderclay. He's a manipulator. He wants to keep you in chains. And I thought, <laughs> if this person only knew my life. 
So, okay, you know, used all my pastoral tricks. Let me see if I can talk to him, get him into better space, and he can pack up his stuff and move along because if I don't, and I let him stay the day, one day is going to turn to two days, and already he's stuffing some of his stuff in bushes, and again, people are going to clear that stuff out, and the cycle is going to continue. So I sit down with him, and I said, you know, we have to talk about this. There's no we. Well, what do you mean there's no we? Just do what you're going to do. Okay, well, you know what I have to do. Well, call the cops. And then, of course, cuss me out. All right, all right. So I'm, uh, I text back and forth with his parole officer often, but uh, his parole officer is limited in terms of what he can do. It's good parole officers really tried a number of things to help him. So call the police. Have the paperwork ready from the restraining order. See how long it takes for the cops to come. See if he's still here when the cops get here. And uh, I kind of thought he would be because, again, I know his patterns pretty well. And he was here. I hear a woman talking to him out there, and he's he, it's pretty smart of the cops to send a lady cop. Well, there's a couple guys with her, but... Um, you know, nice, young, pretty officer, and it'll get a, at least get a much nicer initial conversation going. And so I hear the talk, and I'm kind of listening because he often tells me about his girlfriends that he's got, and that's a whole other weird thing I'm not going to go into. But And then I hear a couple questions. I thought, ah, okay, there's the cops. And so go out there. And, um, and the cops at first think, you know, what's the problem with this guy? You know, comparing to a lot of people, he seems... Fun to talk to and reasonable, and everything's going okay. And then they say the wrong thing, or they do something, and bang, it switches. And I thought, ah, yeah, I knew it was coming. And sure enough, and then of course their demeanor changes, and and we're getting down to business. And but he didn't, he didn't resist putting the cuffs on him. And of course, then he saw me, and you know, it was so funny because yesterday when I left, he. You know, he grumbled at me a little bit and then told me he loved me. And, and both of those things are true. And it's, this, it's the same the other way. So they put the cuffs on him and they put him in the car. And I said, how long are you going to keep him? And she says, well, I don't know. Could be five hours. And I thought, yeah, it's, I've been through this before with him. Could be five hours, could be five days, you know, and go to jail. And they do an assessment and they say, ah, he's better off in the psych ward. So then he goes to the psych ward and they hold him for a 5150 and they hold him for 72 hours. And they get to the end of the site, they get to the end of the 72 hours and, well, there's no real reason to keep him. But, you know, he'll, he violated the restraining order and yada, yada, yada. And just like, just like before when he went to jail, the stuff of the, the petty ante stuff will, you know, will, will pile up and pile up. And then when something serious happens, you know, bang, then the, then the law kicks in and stuff happens. And, you know, you can get frustrated with that. But, you know, what are the police going to do? Um, they have to prioritize violent crime before this kind of nuisance stuff. And, uh, yeah. And so then I, I wrote a, a little Twitter thread about it this morning. And, um, you know, some people respond to me, you know, there's not a lot you can do when someone won't seek help. Mm, he came from a good family. I suspect just kind of piecing, I think about... Gandalf, who uh, found Gollum and tried to piece Gollum's story together through everything. And I, I think about that with how many conversations I have to try to get a picture of what their lives were like. And sometimes I've got random contact with family members and and people who knew them at different points in their life. You know, this guy comes from a good family. His parents are still alive. And I talked to his, I've spoken with his father a number of times because I'll, you know, use my phone and he wants to talk to his parents every now and then. It's just heartbreaking. His parents are quite elderly at this point. He's over 60. and But this is still their son, and they love him, and he's a lovable guy. One day bragged to me he had over 11 DUIs. I totally believe it. 
for a while it was a drug and alcohol counselor. I know this. Um, he has good insurance. And so every time I bring him to the hospital or get him into the psych ward, you know, they always say, oh, you've got good insurance. <laughs> so he can usually get in and he gets in for a few days voluntarily and then he'll get annoyed by being there and he'll cuss out a nurse or an orderly and they'll kick him out and back he goes onto the street and he'll get here and he'll have He'll be in clean clothes, he'll be bathed, he'll be shaven, they've got him on his psych meds, his, his mood is fairly stable, and two or three days later, it's all gone. To, it's, it's, all, it's all over, and he's back into the old cycle. Brags about how he used to run two crack houses, and, and how you know he, he was the best drug and alcohol counselor because he knew it, and uh, he still knows it now, and he'll talk to me about what all the different drugs do and yada, yada, yada. And sometimes he'll tell me, I don't abuse, I use. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been through this with enough individuals to know how these stories end. You know, I was talking to Chris Arnotti about some of this stuff. It's part of the reason this book really touched me. You know, I watched this. I watched my father do this. Growing up, my father, you know, how do I, how do I know? I did just, this, to me, this is just part of pastoring. This is, this is what my father did. This is what Northside Chapel, the church I grew up in was. This is, so this isn't, I know when I got here, people were worried, you know, how's, how's the pastor going to deal with, you know, it's like, (laughs) you know, you don't understand. This is just, this is the job. This is the environment. This is the church. This is the church. I don't want to go to a church where a drunk can't come in or a schizophrenic or someone with bipolar. But he's over 60 now, my friend, and um, you don't last long on the street. There's another guy. His name was Larry. You know, he used to, before we had a fence up, he used to sleep back. Used to tell me how much he liked sleeping under the little pomegranate tree. He got hit. He used to paint. He used to paint apartments. You know, when apartments get recycled, they need to be painted. And so he's a painter, and always had painter's clothes on. And one day, he sits in my office with a can of beer and puts it right on my table in the office. And he says, "My life is in that can." I thought, "Yeah, it is." And you know, he was very honest. He says, "You know, I paint and I make some money and." You know, if the weather turns bad, I might get into a cheap hotel for a little while and just to get out of the elements. But I, I don't want, I don't want rent taking up all my money. My money is for the beer. Most of these guys have been through twelve-step programs. They've been through detox. They've they've been through it all multiple times, and they just come round and round and round. And Larry got hit by a car, broke his hip. It was homeless, homeless guy with a walker. At that point, we'd had a child care center here, so the place was fenced, and he couldn't sleep under the pomegranate tree anymore, so he was sleeping in the bushes in the church across the street. I remember him coming out of the bushes one morning with the walker, and I just thought, wow. Then he disappeared. Where? In a nursing home or the, or the cemetery. Do these guys have agency? Well, you can't help someone who won't seek help. And, um, you know, service resistant. You know, we come up with all these names for people. They're, they're service resistant. Um, they have a degree of agency. They certainly are exhibiting it to me. They tell me exactly what they're doing. And then if you look at the social media, you almost get the, get the sense that these this political drama we watch unfolding that's sort of possessing, I don't know what percentage of the nation is just hooked on the news of one brand or another and found this cool little cartoon that kind of sort of illustrates the bipolar political distraction. Guy starts off on the political spectrum, go left or go right. Hmm. He says, I like freedom, so he moves left. People should be free, so he keeps moving left. But if freedom means doing what I want, I have to want something. I have to want something. What do I want? 
So, well, what, what do you want? Well, I don't know. What do you feel that you want? You want your desires. You want, you want, you want things you see. I'm preaching on thou shalt not covet this week. You know, I, I, people sometimes ask, well, what do you want to do? I, I want to do what I'm doing now. I love the rhythm of, of preaching because it adds a, it adds an external track against which to reflect on the other random things that happen during my life, like getting my friend in cuffs and putting him in a police car and bringing him off to jail. And I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what I dread more, <laughs> putting him in the police car or having him come back, which will happen. It's, it's not going away. Some people think, well, you'll call the cops and you have restraining order and that will settle it. It's like, no, it won't. It's not how these things work. The cartoon continues. I guess I want good things for me, for my family, for my society. So he keeps walking left. <laughs> so freedom isn't just a negative, the absence of constraints. There's also a positive aspect to freedom, the freedom to pursue good. A drug addict isn't really free, obviously. So he keeps moving left. Maybe this also applies to society. Like maybe for a society to be truly free, we have to be, we have to have positive goals and to be free to pursue them. So he keeps moving left. And then he comes back over and he sees the original left-right polarity where he started and said, How did I get over here? So if this bipolar political distraction, it doesn't matter, of course it matters. Of course this stuff matters. And I don't fault either partisan group for not caring. They care. Maybe what they have difficulty with is perspective, finding milestones and boundary markers to that, that aren't that aren't a function of the political matrix. So they can gain some orientation, some perspective. You know. Navigating the ocean was a very difficult thing because, of course, you didn't have landmarks. It's just ocean. And so, well, have to use the stars. Someone this morning, I probably do owe you a conversation. You throw a lot of good stuff at me on Twitter, pointed me to a letter between um, Daniel Dennett and Alex Rosenberg about High octane debate about the big question is meaning and purpose possible in a world increasingly explained by purposeless physics and neuroscience. And this is this is pure meaning crisis stuff. Remember when I talk about the meaning crisis how it's there's sort of two things that prompt it. One is the enlightenment posture that the the world is dead and and any purpose we either bring to the world or project onto the world. And, and so we are the island of purpose in the middle of a dead world. But then with the increasing advance of neuroscience and the more we learn the, the, the spirit of geometry within us, the more we learn the cause and effects that are pushing our buttons, the more we increase in, in psychology and sociology and understand the, the neuroscience and the brain chemicals, then the more we wonder, are we in fact an island of purpose or is our purpose an illusion? And again, as I mentioned in the videos, I, I watched this listened to this podcast with Sam Harris and it was a, it was 2010 all over again and this this young devotee talking about you know I think your message of 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 you know of there being of agency being an illusion I think we need to get this out why so people can believe it and choose it and you know again I I watch the I know some people think I'm straw manning Sam Harris but you know, Strawn says I'm not um, but you know, I watched he and Brett Weinstein go round and round and I watched him and Jordan Peterson go round and round. And you know, these were, you know, friendly, purposive attempts at getting greater clarity and, you know, listening to these two guys, it was amazingly amazing. It wasn't that, that one says there per there's purpose and the other doesn't. It's one says you're too easy on the purpose thing. There's not purpose out there, and so there's none in you either, unless I'm making an argument and using reason to make an argument. But every time someone says science explains, it's like, 
you're giving up the game. And Paul Ann Leitner responded to my tweet. Is that a telos I see embedded in your language? <laughs> we can't help it. It is embedded in our language. But how do we reason and argue without of it? How do we live without of it? Once you utter this, you've obviously given up the game. You've anthropomorphized the process and imbued it with purpose. All in the service of saying there is none. What is the value of knowing cause and effect if you can't wield it? Isn't, isn't this what's, what's supposed to bring in the, the rationalist eschaton? The, finally, when we, when we divorce the world of all of, this, all of this bad mythology and religion, then, but we're not purposes, purposive. Purpose is an illusion. So why would you argue? Well, I'm just programmed to argue. Okay. I had the conversation with um, with the two Michaels about Owen Barfield, and I really like um, Michael DeFuche's observations about the active and the passive in the middle. And and I remember learning middle voice when I was learning Greek in college, and it was like, what does this mean? You, you just don't quite have a category, and it's very difficult to learn because it, it's just not in your realm of experience. And and I like how Mike sort of laid out, you know, the modernist active world of nouns. You know, it's the beginning of Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning, Two Ways to Construe the World as a, a Place of Object or a Forum for Action. So you have nouns and verbs. But modernism is sort of active um, nouns. You know, we assume our privileged position of an island of purpose to wield the world of nouns. That's modernity. And postmodernity comes along and it's it's purely passive. We're all dupes of second level explanations beneath the surface. It's your it's your patriarchy or it's your or it's your colonialism or it's you know it's it's all the ways that you've been duped by these ancient narratives and well well, you know, there's a there's a problem of a law of regression in there. Well well where, where do the narratives come from? Where do the dupings come from? Well, it's it's evil people way in the past, but but who spawned these evil people? And pretty quickly we're in one of these Gnostic situations where the world is a product of a demiurge, but there is no real God or good God out there. And we're all just in some ways, this is it's what's so ironic is it's sort of the the flip side, but it's completely analogous to to, to Sam Harris, wokeism is the political expression of this illusion. Oh, you think you're being objective with your science and with all this stuff? It's it's just an illusion. The big irony for anti-woke Sam Harris. He says there's no agency, and if the other side realized what they were saying, yeah, we agree, there is no agency. You're just a, a white colonialist patriarch. Okay. No agency. Well, if there's no agency, you can't really blame anybody either. But as C.S. Lewis pointed out in Miracles, no one seems to be able to stick to that script. They can't stick to either script. We can't divorce ourselves of agency. It, it just, you know, no matter how pure you try to get with, with what's his name? Alex Rosenberg beating up on Daniel Dennett, that he's, he's soft on purposes, purposism. So I'll pull a bulverism out. If you don't know what a bulverism is, Google it because C.S. Lewis used it and you'll go right to it. Well, none of them believe in God because they don't want someone else in control. I, I love that place in, in The Matrix where Neon says, I don't like to think that I'm not in control of my life. And, and again, I, I watch these Christian atheist debates and I just think, I'm not sure that this is... I'm not always sure that this is a meaningful difference. Well, now I'm in trouble with my Christian friends. Uh, understand what I mean by that. That, well, it's a common thing for preachers to say to their congregation, you know, if you really believed, you wouldn't be having all this anxiety. And to turn around and say to the atheists, atheists well, if you, if you really believe that there is no illusion or there is no agency, it's all just an illusion, well then, you wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. But get out of bed they do. And Chesterton made this point. Lewis made the point. It's an easy point to make. 
Lewis makes it pretty clear in his book Miracles. A strict materialism refutes itself for the reason given long ago by Professor Haldane, who gets quoted in that letter between the two of them. And my, if my mental processes are determined wholly by the motion of atoms in my brain, substitute atoms for any other um, unintelligible process that you can imagine and is contemporary and up to date, the chemistry of my brain, let's say, the physics of my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true. And hence, I have no reason to suppose my brain to be composed of atoms. Haldane, purpose of uh, possible worlds. But naturalism, even if it's not purely materialistic, seems to me to involve the same difficulty. Though in a somewhat less obvious form, it, decred it discredits our process of reasoning or at least reduces their credit to such a humble level that it can no longer support naturalism itself. And, you know, someone in the Discord was mentioning Alvin Planting. Alvin, this is basically Alvin Planting's argument, too. The same argument gets that gets joined again and again. If 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 I can dismiss both Alex Rosenberg's and Daniel Dennett's arguments by saying, well, they're just making these arguments because they don't want to believe in God, or they're just making these arguments because they're white, or they're just making these arguments because they're men, or they're just making these arguments because they have money and status as being philosophers and they enjoy all the attention paid by others and they're trapped by their particular philo philosophical and, and political tribe. That's the only reason for their argument. I've just simply cut out the legs from their argument. And the point of a bulverism is that you can do this any time, all the time. And, and in many ways, that's exactly where we're at politically. And so we have this big fight going on on Twitter where <laughs> Joey mentioned she's just being lawyerly. She's just speaking what her, her see, there I'm doing it again. She's just speaking what her clients are telling her to speak. It doesn't have to have any relationship to truth. She's paid to say this. And so how do you know a lawyer is lying? He or she is moving their lips because they're paid to say, you know, I'm sure, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm asserting that my client is innocent. And if a lawyer is saying this, everyone just rolls their eyes because that doesn't mean anything about that. They're just paid to do that. And then Twitter, you know, so we will not be intimidated. We are going to clean this mess up now. Well, good. I'd love to see it cleaned up. President Trump won by a landslide. Okay. We are going to prove it. Good. And we are going to reclaim the United States of America for the people who voted for freedom. Well, that all sounds Sidney Powell. Amen. And then Twitter weighs in. Multiple sources called this election differently. <laughs> it sounds like Steve Urkel. <laughs> and so you have these two sides and back and forth they go. And maybe, maybe this person that says I'm a manipulator trying to keep you in change thinks that I'm I don't know which side he's pulling for. <laughs> I don't, it's just, it just makes me laugh. They believe Trump won because they're stupid, because they're fooled, because they're religious bigots, because they only watch Fox News or listen to Alex Jones and they've been duped. And there's some bulverism why they don't know the truth, which we clearly know. And then the other side, well, they only believe Biden won because they've been groomed by the mainstream media or they've been deceived by the industrial educational complex. Well, we're lost out at sea and we can't navigate. And how can we know the truth? Well, we're going to use reason. Well, reason is always undercut by, well, you can't really reason if it's just random processes that are making your mouth move or it's the, the money of your client or it's the your religious upbringing or it's the, the, the education you received at Berkeley or, or, or some other woke place or it's the lack of education because you're out there um, fixing cars or, you know, selling cars. So what is reason? And again, for Lewis, reason is is sort of something that, I mean, he did. for him, reason is you know almost God. Reason is the capacity to see something outside of ourselves. 
not just an end point of a closed system of mindless cause and effect. Reason is to be actually be able to ascertain some truth out there. And, and that's different from this, this belief in the scientific process or, or even reasoning, although reasoning has, has something to do with, with it for Lewis. And again, the definition I use, it's a thread you can push. Why do I say it that way? Because we recognize the thread. Even if you're managing a bulverism and you're talking about a lawyer, you say, well, the client is paying the lawyer money, so the lawyer is going to say what the client wants them to say. Well, there's the thread. Well, if you can see the cause, can you push the thread? Can you exactly assert reason? Can you see a goal and move towards it? You see the reason. The only way to do this is to believe that you can see through, that you can know a truth outside of the processes that are working within me. And are not simply possessed by the process of imagining you know the truth, because those who say Trump stole the is trying to steal the election, and those who say Biden is trying to steal the election, well, I'm not saying they're not sincere. I'm sure some of them on both sides are insincere, but a good many of them are sincere. I would imagine. But now, without this premise, without imagining you can see the thread and eventually sort of push the thread because we're we're really bad at finally achieving what we want to, especially on a large scale, um, nothing matters. Now, back to the homeless situation. We're confronted by ourselves and... You know, C.S. Lewis's great line, the door to hell is locked from the inside. He probably got it from someone else. The homeless guy isn't irrational. He, many times I'll try to say him, let's, let's, uh, let's get you a place to live. After his two years out, money piled up in his account. I don't think it was supposed to. He had like $10,000. He got out. I said, look. You got $10,000. We can get you into a decent apartment and all by yourself. So you won't have anyone to annoy you. And, you know, I know he likes the drums. I said, you know, we can get you a drum set. You know, we can, we can get, we can get all this set up. We can get you a better life than you've had for the last 10 years. Even tried to put him on a bus to, to, uh, Utah. That was probably sort of selfish. But hey, you can see your parents. I'm not sure his parents would want him showing up at their door. I'm not sure that would have been a good idea. But I wanted to do anything to try and avoid putting him back in that police car and having him haul him away because does he belong in jail? Well, he broke the law. Is that the best place for him or for the system or for jail? No, not really. He's not that dangerous. <laughs> that dangerous he's a little dangerous it just depends who you are if you're bigger and stronger he's not too dangerous but if you're smaller and weaker yeah he can be they always every time i call the cops they ask does he have any weapons he doesn't have any guns does he have any knives yeah will he use them as a weapon probably not but they can't take their chance one day when he asked me to call to get him in um, he was sick. And, uh, so I called and they first wanted to send the fire truck and, and they're like, well, does he have a history of violence? Yes. Does he have any knives or guns? No guns. Knives? Yeah. A few. All right. Have to send the police first or with the fire. And it's like, these big scrapping firefighters get out of the truck and it's like, he's not going to attack you. <laughs> he's not dumb. <laughs> he's not irrational. He knows what he wants. He saves his money for the drugs and the alcohol and is willing to tolerate the uncomfortable weather and the fear and the, and the, and the, and the intermittent trips to jail and to the hospital in order to seek what he wants. He's reasonable. He's purposive. 
But but how does that reason and that purpose mesh with everyone else's around? It doesn't, not very well. Day after day, people who don't live right here on this corner drive by and give him food or money or clothing. The people who live right here hate his guts. The people, it's lovely to be benevolent and generous and to give him something and to feel good about yourself and to go home and say, well, I've helped a poor person today. Yeah, that's lovely. I have that same thing. It's a much different thing to have to live with him and the mess and the, you know, when he's when he's in bad mood and he's up here and he's, <laughs> one day I walk out, you know, I've, he's had, I told you about the foundation of the Lord. I come out and the place is just full of garbage and Another guy, you know, there's basically there's the front row and the back row people. He's most of most of his friends are back row people. There is drug dealers. There is for one reason or another, these are the people that are sort of living in the same isolated world. And the police and the cops and the social workers are kind of the priests between these two worlds. So one day I hear noises and open the door and there he is having sex. I mean, I'm, I'm right here at the outside of a busy street. He and the woman are having sex right here in broad daylight. And it's like, um, of course, I know her too because she lives in a group home and she's schizoaffected. I've watched her deteriorate over the last number of years. She often comes in and she wants a Bible and a bottle of water. So I usually don't. I, I've given her enough Bibles over the years to know they don't last. And so I find some old daily bread or some little devotional and a bottle of water, and off she goes happy. Another day I come out there, and there's a huge mess, and the other guy decides he's going to get on my good side and says, this is terrible what he's done to the foundation of the Lord. <laughs> the foundation of the Lord. Another day I go out the same, you know, I'm gonna, you want him to beat, you want me to beat him up for you, Pastor? No, don't beat him up. Yeah, I'll do it, Pastor. Uh, I'm kind of doubtful. He wasn't too big either. But, um, you know, all this righteous indignation about what this individual had done to the foundation of the Lord. And a few days later, I walk out and he's sitting there smoking a joint with the other guy. And it's like so much for the righteous indignation. This one individual, you know, Pastor, you should you shouldn't let this place get so bad. And it's like, it's your stuff in the bushes. You should really crack down because there's some other homeless people. You should you shouldn't let them. You should you should send them away. Should I send you away? Well, I'm an asset, not a liability. Oh, okay. But to the rest of his his choices are annoying, inconvenient, irrational, filthy, dangerous, costly to public funds. I can't imagine what he costs the city and the county and the federal government every year. We're confronted by ourselves. Do we have agency? It's not all the philosophical, it's not all the philosophical arguments that that tend to bend you towards imagining that, you know, sound and fury signifying nothing. But we are on a brief journey. So this morning I put my friend in a police cruiser, and this afternoon I got a phone call from someone that I'll keep it inconvenient not on key I'll keep it vague because not all the family has been mem- has been notified but um, another friend has died not from COVID just wasn't wasn't a surprise knew it was coming person had been disabled now for a while didn't have hadn't had much quality of life for the past few years was still a friend, someone I'd ministered to and someone who had ministered to me. This morning, one of you, <laughs> folks sent me stuff, sent me this uh, interesting blog post, and, and this individual sent me a number from uh, Bruce Charlton. I don't know who that is, Bruce Charlton's notion, but he writes, uh, he's got a good blog and he writes good stuff on it, you know. Philosophers or indeed authors more generally who assume that this mortal life bounded by conception and death is the unit of meaning always fall within one or two categories. The optimists say that real life is life at its best. 
The bad stuff is due to wrong perspectives, wrong choices, and our problem is that is that the best is infrequent, does not last, and and maybe maybe absent. And so you know, this is sort of Sam Harris. Well, once we get our reason, well then everything will be dandy. The pessimists, more common, assert that real life this is Jordan Peterson, life at worst, the reality of suffering, disease, decay. And that the best bits of living are ultimately evanescent illusions, wistful thinking, self-deception, a personal delusion, a temporary mania. The two attempts escape from this are either to assert ultimate oneness, which attempts to remove the difference between good and bad bits by removing individual awareness of that discernment, or else versions of living in the moment, which, in effect, say that the instantaneous moment is the true, li- is the true unit of life. Life is therefore static, and whatever is in the moment is everything. This collapses when one moment changes to another. Then what? Or when the moment is bad and there is no counterbalance or context for its badness, and for exaggeration, pain is totality. My conclusion is that there is no possible co- coherence attainable when the unit of life is regarded as being bounded by conception and death. Because what meaning and purpose in life is possible when my life and every life is temporary and inevitably ends in death. Life and living is then finite. Death and nothingness is the only infinite. Read the whole thing. It's a good piece. It's not very long. This is the grave of my father from a few years ago. My aunt is in the picture. She would die a few years later. My uncle, one of my uncles in the picture, recovering from COVID. I'm glad he's recovered. I didn't know that that would happen. Another uncle in the picture, now living in a retirement home after the death of his wife. Very social guy. Why can't he go to church? Why can't he eat in the dining hall? Life is short. Sometimes it's long. If we reason, (laughs) if we reason not, then what's the point? This great little video from After School on Choose Your Sacrifice. There's a sacrificial element in maturation. This was sort of peak Jordan Peterson. It happens whether you do it or not. You can choose your damn limitations or have them chosen for you. Agency, reason, pushing that thread, imagining there's purpose, imagining there's something better, imagining our actions are meaningful. Raj, who came to the meetup, you know, said it very well. He said ego at first, but then I thought about that. He thought about, no, it's agency. What Jordan Peterson did was imbue a fair amount of agency into people and say, okay, do something. We tend to use dead reckoning, intuition as a means of guessing at the good. That's basically Sam Harris's well-being argument. It's sort of dead reckoning, and we can we can look at people who aren't being purposive, and we can say it's not a good way to live because they waste their time, they waste their life. They're not getting anywhere. We value people with agency, and and they, they have agency, and they assert meaning, and, and it seems a pretty good, and of course, this is Jordan Peterson's meaning is his sacrament, meaning is his gyroscope within the iron box of secularism, within the submarine submerged within a dead world. Meaning is do what's meaningful, not what's expedient. What was Jordan saying? He was saying, you can push the thread. You can see the thread, now push it. Compasses are low resolution, but they tell you something. You can see through reason, your eyes. You you can see through. You can know the truth. Uh, Tomorrow or the next day or the next day, a few days from now, my friend will be back. He might be mad that I called the cops. 
but we'll get over it. We've gotten over bigger things. He might come out and apologize for some of the words he said when he was in handcuffs. He might not. He'll probably show up when he needs help. And I sit down and I tell him sometimes, I try to take him out to eat, but he can't eat much anymore. One year, when there's still the buffet restaurant in this neighborhood, a lot of businesses have left. I took him to the buffet restaurant because buffet restaurants usually tolerate people a little bit more than other sit-down restaurants. So I took him to the buffet restaurant and you can eat anything you want, eat as much as you want. Ate a little bit of soup, that was it. Should have just bought him a bowl of soup. And I look at him and I say, you know, you can have a life. You can have a better life. And he looks at me and says, I've had a better life. This is what I want. All right. But you can't do it here. But I want to do it here. And you can't do it here. So please choose to live. Dare to do. Dare to think. Dare to speak, dare to listen, dare to meet, dare to care, dare to love, dare to mourn, dare to argue, dare to be patient with people who think differently from you, dare to hope, dare to believe. I'm quite persuaded by Lewis's argument that even this stuff, You can follow the thread all the way up to the top. That this ability to reason is a gift from God. And he gives his gifts liberally. Causes it to rain on the just and the unjust. He brings the rain on the good and the bad. He loves Trump supporters and Biden supporters. Next Sunday, I was going to say you'll find them in church, but maybe you won't. (laughs) Ha, ha. The real faithful will be watching on their computer screens, their poor pastors all having become TV evangelists. But dare to live. Dare to live.